The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, hi, so uh, we are live, uh, but we are going to take uh, two, three minutes uh, for everybody to, to be with us here. And then I'll introduce myself and um, I'll leave the floor to the trainer so he can introduce himself and, and start with the presentation. So, uh, yeah, we'll just wait for, for two to three minutes. I see the number is increasing, so yeah, people are logging. It's uh, 3.32 now, so we are right on time. Uh, okay, so I believe uh, we can we can start now. And uh, for all of all of you that will uh, be joining us a little bit later, uh, we will share the recordings of this uh, webinar after it's finished, so you can catch on anything that you've missed, uh, and uh, and if you. You have some, some things that need to be clarified. Uh, so uh, I will introduce myself, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm really glad that I can welcome you to this session on the uh, rethinking treasury management. Uh, uh, we are organizing. Um, I am Anna. Uh, I am here uh, to to make sure that everything runs uh, really smoothly. Uh, so I'll be here uh, at all friends and at all times, and I'll be able to to help with with anything uh, that uh, the trainer or you'll be needing. Uh, I just want to mention uh, two things. So uh, first is that everybody uh, after after the the, uh, the webinar is finished will receive a certification uh, of of uh, attendance. Uh, via email and also the recorded version of this uh, webinar so you can catch uh, if you missed something out um, it will be uh, the duration will be appro approximately two hours so uh, first we'll uh, listen and see uh, to the trainer uh, to the expert trainer Mark Canizo uh, he'll present um, uh, all everything and after that we'll have a short Q&A session where you can ask your questions and I strongly encourage everybody uh, to use this op opportunity uh, to get your questions answered by the trainer. Uh, I will be reading the questions at the end and so the trainer can answer uh, all of the questions. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, I will leave the floor to the expert trainer, Mark Canizo. Uh, he will introduce himself and, uh, and start this, this uh, webinar. So, uh, Mark, do we uh, have you on board? I think you do. One moment, I'm just going to uh, just have to repeat the uh, sharing of the screen. One second. Okay. 
now now we can see so you can see good yeah i believe you're you're all set uh so that will be from my side the floor is yours mark uh and wait, wait before you leave me i have to uh drag the uh yeah pictures out of the way let me just try the application again and uh I don't actually see my own presentation now. Uh, we, we tested this before no, now, and it was now showing. We see it. Now we see it. You're you're fine. So you can yeah. yes. The problem is I don't see it. I'm going to just uh one second, please. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. All I see is our two uh, webcams, and I, I'm trying to turn the webcams off. Yeah, let's try like this. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you, uh, is this okay now? Uh, yes. Okay. If you can, if you, if this is good, this is. Uh, I'll speak from from here now. If this is good, can you? Is everything okay, Anna? Before you leave it uh, to me. Yes, actually, we are not seeing uh, your presentation. Oh, uh, you don't see the presentation. Now I see the presentation. Yeah. That's why I thought it was the. Uh, okay, hold on a second. I will share the presentation now. One second, please. Uh, can you see the presentation now? No. Okay. And now? now? Now we can see it, yes. Okay, super. That's uh, that's all I needed to do. I think uh, it was a few extra clicks to uh, <laughs> to drag my picture out of the way because I was blocking my own presentation. I'm using different platforms these days, and uh, each one has slightly different control panels. Uh, is it okay now? Can you see the full presentation? Yes, we are seeing it. You are uh, good. Perfect. Okay. Okay. I'll All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Off we go. No. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. And uh, nice to know that you're out there. And uh, I'm going to uh, spend about 90 minutes to uh, talk about this uh, topic that's been uh, advertised to you today, which is the uh, uh, Rethinking uh, Treasury uh, Management. And uh, maybe just uh, Anna, do, do jump in anytime you see that something is not uh, looking the way it should look, or if I stop talking suddenly. Okay? Sure, no if worries, I'm, no worries. If I'm moving my if I'm moving my lips, but not uh, any sound coming out, then uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm sleep talking. Okay, so the agenda today, a very loose agenda and a very flexible agenda. Uh, clearly, everybody is concerned about learning about Treasury in the new context. Now, the uh, obviously, everything we've learned in the past until now has not taken COVID into account. So I don't have any ready-made solutions today. Uh, what I do have, and what I believe we've always had in our training courses, is the ability to think and to think outside the box. In other words, when we talk about Treasury, uh, uh, products and uh, treasury tools. What we're uh, training people to do is not to only how to use the existing tools, but how to uh, think about in, in, in the context of the work that they perform, what kind of new tools need to be uh, designed in order to meet the needs of a changing environment. Now, ironically, when I was uh, teaching uh, uh, last year, I spent quite a few times uh, in, in uh, Riyadh, in Jeddah, and also in uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi. I, I recall thinking back to uh, and discussing with the class uh, the impact of the financial crisis 10 years ago and the fact that uh, a lot of expats uh, living in the Gulf, they basically uh, left the, uh, the, uh, the, the Emirates 
uh, with leased cars in the parking lot at the uh, airports. They, left the, they simply turned off the engine, left the key in the ignition, and they went and they caught their planes. Because their jobs were gone, they had uh, rent that they, uh, they had rental contracts on the apartments. They didn't, uh, they, they abandoned those because there was no need to stay on and uh, continue to pay rent and so on. So there was a complete disruption and everything sort of changed overnight. And people told me how strange it was to have uh, empty hotels uh, in, uh, in Dubai. And we uh, never imagined that just a few months after my last visit in December to, uh, to, to Dubai, we would be facing again the same uh, a similar situation. So this is uh, this is puzzling for all of us. It's uh, disturbing, obviously, for all of us. And uh, like you, the audience, uh, we trainers are are also people, and also living under uh, restrictions and so on. And uh, therefore, we don't have sort of a magic uh, answer to everything. But what I hope we do and can offer is uh, the uh, ability to be able to challenge people's thinking so that you have greater confidence in saying, my gosh, the challenges out there actually present us with opportunities. And so we're gonna have to, gonna have to uh, make the best we can to, to extract opportunities from the new, new environment. If it makes you feel any better, I'm not sure if this is a good way of uh, make feeling better, is remember that your uh, competitors as well are also faced with the same conditions. So at the industry level, for example, uh, all companies are facing the same challenges here. So you're not a dis disadvantage to, to other people. Uh, everybody is uh, experiencing a uh, decline in demand simultaneously. That's a problem. That's a, that's a global problem. And uh, how that's being met by different governments and so on. Some governments say that we should just uh, let the... Uh, uh, virus uh, run through the uh, uh, population, sort of a, what they call herd immunity. It's a very uh, sort of old-fashioned kind of idea. Uh, other people say that we need to uh, conquer the uh, medical situation before we can tackle the economic situation. Okay, those are political questions. I'm not going to address those directly today. Um, what I do want to do is talk about the uh, Treasury and some of the key issues that are um, related to liquidity, um, assessing, uh, doing financial analysis, and looking at some hedging of uh, foreign exchange and interest rate uh, risk. And uh, I'm doing so with the, with the specific intention of uh, bringing to your attention the kinds of courses that we uh, are always in the process of uh, designing and delivering and evolving and so on uh, in the area of uh, treasury. One being the Certified Treasury um, Program, which is the CTP, that's the uh, American Treasury, uh, Certified Treasury Professional. I'm sure you're aware of, of that from uh, later on. I've been uh, preparing uh, several um, waves of students, mostly in uh, Saudi Arabia, for the, uh, for the uh, exam, uh, which is an online exam for the CTP. And it's something that I hope uh, you will be uh, interested in pursuing if you want to uh, broaden your treasury uh, skills. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have more to say, even if you have some questions at the end about the, uh, uh, the qualifications such as the CTP. We also do something else, which is called the CBTM, which is the Certified Bank Treasury Manager. And uh, I've done that a couple of times as well last year. That's also in uh, constant evolution, but I think it's, uh, it's, been, it's, come, uh, it's been very well received by banking people, risk managers, relationship managers, people in a credit department and so on, and uh, various levels of uh, management. Um, and I'll pick out some examples from there as well, which I will talk about um, today. Then uh, we should also keep in mind that everybody needs to do financial analysis of one sort or another. So the uh, corporate credit analysis, things like that, we cover those areas as well. Uh, I do this together with a colleague, an American colleague called uh, Mike Turner. He's a uh, CPA. He's also doing a webinar right now uh, somewhere else. Um, I myself, uh, he's the accountant. I'm the uh, I'm, I'm the uh, banker by by training, so I spent uh, ten years. I believe we we lost Mike. Uh, 
uh, I believe he has a problem with with the internet. I'm guessing. So we will just wait for him to come back. Uh, okay, uh, while we wait for Mark, uh, I believe he has um, some problem with his internet connection. Uh, I just wanted to... Oh, it's, uh... Okay, Mark, mm -hmm. we have you. Can you hear, can you hear me now? Uh, we lost you for, for a moment. Uh, we cannot see Yes, you I now. think so. Yeah, again, it was unclear to me when you lost me, but I did hear your voice, of course, reminding me or, or bringing it to my attention. So. Yes. Uh, it so, comes and goes. Yes. So how uh, are we now? We are not seeing you. We are just hearing you. So if you can check your oh. camera. Yes, of course. And I just want to, to remind everybody that uh, after the presentation, uh, we are doing Q&A. So uh, make sure you 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 write your question and uh, Mark here will will be uh, happy to to answer it at at the end of of this webinar. So, Mark, okay, you're all set. We can hear uh, see you. Can we hear you? Good. Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Super. Thank you very much. Yes. No okay. I'm not sure when I cut out, but I uh, I was just saying that I worked for Citibank for uh, ten years in Switzerland, in corporate banking and in uh, private banking. So, I've got a uh, banker's background, which means that when I look at financial analysis. I look at it from the point of view of uh, lending to uh, companies, but also to uh, appreciate more generally how a company is performing. So I thought that we would also uh, touch on uh, financial analysis to uh, today as well. So we have some broad ranging topics here and I want to uh, dive into them so that we can uh, treat them each uh, in turn. And in this way, I hope that I can uh, also uh, uh, sort of tickle your interest into uh, looking into the uh, various uh, training offerings which uh, Leron has, which goes into these uh, these different topics, uh, starting with, uh, as I mentioned before, the CTP, the Certified uh, uh, Treasure, Treasury Professional. That's uh, a, uh, an American um, qualification. Oh, one thing I should mention about the CTP before I forget is that the CTP has uh, gone through uh, some modifications uh, from last year, and I was just looking at the new materials which have been uh, uh, enhanced. And I think the key modification, and this may be important to some of you who've spoken to uh, friends and colleagues who've uh, signed up for the CTP in the past, um, the, the Americans are aware uh, that the uh, CTP has to have a broader appeal internationally. So the uh, changes which they have made have been mostly towards uh, making sure that there's a little bit less emphasis to the American uh, institutional arrangements and more emphasis to the international, you know, with regard to payment systems and so on, which is actually good because I also live outside the United States and I find it to be kind of uh, strange to be talking about check payments when uh, everybody in Europe and I believe in the uh, Middle East as well is pretty much using uh, electronics, uh, electronic fund transfers for uh, for corporate uh, disbursements. So. That's a good step forward. I think it will make the CTP more appealing for uh, anybody who wants to uh, 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 deepen their, uh, their um, competence in the uh, treasury area. Okay, so uh, let's just uh, cover a couple of uh, issues here. So the, we have had several weeks uh, to spend at home and think about how our business will be affected by the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Pandemic. And sort of the more we learn about it, the more uh, kind of confusing the situation is on the uh, biological side. Uh, let's hope that we have greater clarity about what companies have to do. Um, we, we've also run several financial management related webinars uh, addressing different aspects of, of these challenges that are facing us and uh, how one might plan for them. 
And this is very much uh, from a business planning point of view, and uh, more specifically from a treasury point of view. Um, I broke down uh, the, the planning uh, horizon into typically sort of uh, three steps, the uh, short term, medium term, and long term. And I think the uh, short term is the most uh, appropriate and relevant for our uh, treasury topic today, because the uh, in the short term, obviously, everybody was uh, in a desire to um, conserve cash. And that's, uh, that's the first and important requirement which uh, companies have to look after. And uh, in order to conserve cash means to figure out all the sources of cash that you can pool for uh, your business needs. And then, of course, the next thing is to see what kind of uh, business needs do you have? And obviously, many people experience the fact that the uh, uh, payments of the system, the costs have a way of marching on, especially the periodic or, or fixed costs. And uh, there was some hiccup and some question about how quickly uh, revenues would be uh, continue to uh, come into the business. Depending on your uh, industry, uh, you either are lucky and you have ongoing business or you've had to scale it back or even turn it down to, to zero, unfortunately. Um, of course, there was also at that time in the webinar, the question about how to uh, manage the receivables down uh, if you haven't been collecting on a regular basis and uh, uh, also uh, to, to make a separation or to do an assessment of both your uh, customers and your suppliers uh, with regard to who's critical to your business and which ones can you push more than uh, others. And I went on, I, I expanded on that idea about uh, doing your uh, customer and your supplier assessment, looking at your supply chains and so on. And, and the idea there was to uh, take it a relationship approach to the, uh, to the story. In other words, to uh, figure out in a collaborative way with your customers who can pay you on time uh, or pay you maybe with a, a rescheduled uh, payment schedule, having taking into consideration the challenges that are facing you are also facing uh, your, your, your customers. And you don't necessarily want to uh, burn your bridges or uh, sue or break down a good customer relationship when you're going to put value on them uh, in the future. Suppliers, the same story. You don't want to starve your suppliers. Some suppliers may be critical to your success. And ultimately, when things get back to kind of a new normal, uh, you want to have had a uh, 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 to, to thought to, to have thought very hard about how to keep your uh, supplier relationships intact. That is the ones that you uh, value, that you consider to be long-term relationships, where there can be a, a discussion and a, a meeting of uh, of minds. It can work uh, both ways. You you pay them later. They give you uh, supplies on consignment that you can uh, work with. Uh, these were the sorts of things we talked about last time. Um, what was a little bit less uh, connected to Treasury, although everything's connected to Treasury, I think we have to be clear about that. But what was a little bit um, uh, more strategic, business strategic um, in, in, in scope was the medium and long term uh, considerations. The medium term being what, what alternative activities can you uh, turn to which are relevant to the current uh, situation? And this was done a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, actually, more than a, about a month ago. And the uh, you know, the discussion there was whether you know people could be making uh, hospital supplies or uh, you know masks and uh, personal protection gear and so on. This is all geared towards meeting the needs of the uh, the immediate needs of the society, either on a profitable basis or just to keep people uh, working uh, until uh, things uh, move beyond the the immediate uh, lockdown uh, phase. And this is a, a case of strategic thinking outside the box. You know, what sort of things are you equipped to do? How could you um, leverage your uh, existing skills to be able to serve uh, new demands which um, have uh, appeared since the onset of, the, of this uh, COVID pandemic? And then long-term, of course, is doing a strategic business model reassessment, but that's not part of our uh, discussion today. Uh, as you can see here, we're really talking about um, uh, talking about liquidity. That's really as far as I wanted to take it today. And when we talk about liquidity, um, first of all, we should be clear about what the uh, treasury management functions are. 
This is uh, a very general slide, obviously, but one which um, I'll have something more to say about this later on, uh, if we had to sort of fill it in a little bit more um, specifically. But I think you'll recognize here, these are sort of typical uh, short and long-term um, uh, functions in the uh, treasury uh, management. And uh, clearly I'll, I'll be saying a couple things on these different, uh, on these different issues. Okay, um, as Anna said, if you have any questions, please record your questions in the uh, question and answer box or chat box, whatever is provided for you to be able to uh, uh, be in touch with us on a written basis. And I will, I'll stop in about an hour to give you a chance to, uh, so we can listen to the questions. Um, here, here's a key uh, idea here, which I, I want to emphasize. And this is very much uh, connected to the idea of, uh, in, in this uh, context, in this period, now Treasury and more broadly uh, financial management remains very much a, at the center of what's going on because you can see that all of these, uh, uh, all, all of these spokes here, all of these uh, uh, functions are very much dependent, are, are connected to Treasury and uh, the Treasury is very much the coordination hub that allows um, the, these other functions to, to take place. And uh, we have to have good internal communications. So ironically, we're also, a lot of us are sitting at home and uh, having to perform work at a distance. We cannot meet together with our, uh, our colleagues in, in a real situation. You've probably had a number of... Uh, uh, Zoom type of uh, meetings with your colleagues now to be able to keep things moving forward. Uh, it's ironic, isn't it, when internal communications become extremely important now because of the disruption of the pandemic, and yet we are all split from each other in a physical way, and therefore are having more difficulty. It's, it's ironic. So um, how we work around that, obviously each company has to uh, find its own way uh, I can only say that, you know, thank goodness that we have the uh, communications devices that are, exist now. If we were uh, looking at this pandemic maybe uh, 10 or 15 years ago, it would be quite a different situation. Can you imagine getting on the telephone and talking to people just voice only and then saying, I'm going to send you an email and uh, to talk about something? It will slow down the whole process, okay? So... These are all the things we have to, we have to keep these relationships and these uh, communications intact. And that is the uh, challenge which is uh, facing us. Okay, we also spoke of uh, government programs last time in the uh, webinar. And uh, since of course we uh, are talking internationally here, there's no one country or jurisdiction that you know, we can be specific about. But I think we agreed that business managers are more proactive people. And while they do look uh, for uh, the possibility to get some kind of government funding and a backstop or guarantee for their businesses. Um, business managers tend to want to secure their financial position as best they can under their own initiative. In other words, uh, people who are entrepreneurial oriented, entrepreneurially oriented, are not going to wait for someone else to come and help them. Another observation is that um, business cash, uh, cash reserves uh, the level may have to be higher in the future. And this is one of the uh, uh, kind of observations which came up last time that I wanted to share with you now, because this is relevant to the uh, liquidity story. You, you know, uh, probably early on in, in the pandemic, when the uh, first, uh, and to my knowledge, the only package that the uh, U.S. Congress has passed for the uh, for American businesses, um, there was some discussion about who that help should be directed to. And there was some criticism of, uh, of uh, corporations which had spent the last few years uh, buying back their shares. In other words, they had excess cash reserves. They didn't have anything to uh, invest those cash reserves into and therefore um, uh, were, were engaging in sort of multi-year, multi-billion do dollar share buyback schemes. And uh, people in Congress were saying, well, now that they've uh, paid all this money back to uh, shareholders, now they want to have a bailout. I mean, this is, you know, 
uh, people wanted to write into the rescue packages, no uh, share buybacks. In other words, the company, Boeing is a good example. They were subject to a lot of criticism because they said, we, we will have to stop operating if we, after a few months if we don't have government assistance. And, and the response was, well, you know, if you hadn't uh, bought back all those shares and spent all that cash you had in the last uh, few years, you would have sufficient cash now. Now, of course, you could say that's 2020 vision and uh, any, uh, any uh, sensible uh, treasurer would say, we don't want to hold more cash than is necessary in our balance sheet because it's inefficient. It's not earning much of an income. We should hold it just for uh, temporary excess uh, uh, requirements, for example, for unexpected um, disbursements. But technically, we should be uh, keeping our cash levels to a, uh, a minimum and that it's, uh, it's actually considered to be uh, economically inefficient to have too much cash. It also opens you up as a uh, takeover target in the uh, mergers and acquisitions area. So there are a lot of good reasons why under normal circumstances and conditions, we wouldn't want to have too much cash in the, uh, in the balance sheet. And we, of course, in our courses, we talk about that as well, talking about the optimization of, of uh, cash levels. But now here we are with the uh, pandemic and people are saying, my gosh, so, you, so a lot of corporations don't even have enough cash to be able to uh, operate for uh, X number of months. That's not a good thing. So don't be surprised going forward if the uh, governmental laws or regulations require businesses to hold a higher level of cash in their balance sheet. For example, some multiple of uh, monthly uh, operating expenses in order to uh, be able to meet uh, uh, certain needs. If, uh, if challenges such as this uh, pandemic occur, which uh, force companies to fall back on their reserves and that they should have enough in the house to be able to uh, survive three or six months. I don't know what the number of months will be. That will be part of the discussion. And even if the government does not require or mandate such, uh, 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 shall we say, uh, uh, rainy day reserves, special reserves of cash, Perhaps management by its own choice going forward will decide that they want to uh, keep a higher level of cash reserves in order to uh, avoid precisely what is happening now. You know very well that in uh, privately owned businesses, for example, there are some business owners, they don't like to use debt because they feel that uh, debt is a kind of uh, enslavement to the banks and therefore they would rather um, uh, finance their business purely on an equity basis. Um, we also deal with that in corporate finance and we say, well, there may be an optimal level in uh, how much debt you should keep in your uh, uh, balance sheet that it's uh, not really optimal to use all equity financing. Um, we, we, we have the uh, uh, experience or the data to, to sort of demonstrate that. But of course, at the end of the day, it's the private business owner's choice how much debt he wants to use. But again, when I think about you know, how we treat the issue of debt, for example, how much debt is too much debt, uh, good, bad, and so on, uh, it's all conditioned by the, um, by the circumstances in which you are, are living. And of course, the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, is already uh, more than 10 years past. So people are kind of relaxing a bit more and saying, well, you know, there's a lot of capital out there which is available for businesses, including uh, uh, debt finance, interest rates are very low. So why not, you know, use more, more debt? Okay, well, that's another subject more in the uh, capital markets uh, uh, area. Let's come back to uh, treasury as in a sort of more short-term aspect. Although I tend to be, you know, I'm happy to move up and down the uh, timeline from the short term to the long term and uh, keep the big picture in, in mind. Okay, um, let's just move ahead here. So when we're talking about liquidity, obviously uh, businesses are all faced with the situation that you see here. This is a typical sort of a cash operating cycle. You're buying uh, materials, you're processing them. This is for a... Uh, a manufacturing company that uh, produces things. 
puts them into uh, inventory, they become finished goods, they have to go out and look for a, uh, a buyer, they find the buyer if they negotiate a sale of their product on, uh, on credit terms, then of course the uh, product is delivered, the sale is considered to be complete, but instead of collecting cash, the company puts a receivable in its uh, balance sheet. And then of course, it's up to somebody in the company to go and chase those receivables. And I am sure that in uh, March and uh, in February and March, when the lockdowns began, uh, started to happen, I'm sure people were scrambling very quickly to uh, look after their uh, uh, collections story and to make sure that they were uh, pulling in cash wherever possible. Uh, of course, it's never a good time when it's, it's a, especially in bad times to start collecting if you haven't been collecting your uh, receivables on a regular basis. That's why it's just good to have good discipline inside a company. And that's why I think this uh, challenge, as uh, disturbing and as maybe dis even distressing as it is, it really is uh, an invitation to us to um, uh, not to accept that we're going to go back to a normal as it was before, but we've got to push to a new normal. And even as companies, we have to define our operations, that rethink our operations and our structure and activities in the treasury area in completely new terms. Now, I don't know what those new terms are going to be yet, but we already have to put that question to ourselves. And that's what we should be working on now as we uh, struggle to keep our, our companies um, operating. Okay, so this is a typical slide I pull out of our other uh, courses which deal with financial management. Um, everybody should know about this. Uh, Uh, Mark, we lost you again. Okay, uh, so uh, we lost Mark um, again uh, due to, I believe, his um, not that good internet connection. So we'll just uh, wait for him to 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 come back. Uh, all of the questions that you have, you can answer, uh, you can uh, ask them now. Uh, Mark will make sure to, to answer it at the end of this session. And to remind everybody and for mm -hmm. those of you, yeah, Mark? Yes. Yes, so we lost Hello. you for, for a second there. Yeah. About 10 seconds, yes. So uh, all, all of you, will, you'll receive the certificates of attendance. Um, after the, the, the this February is finished, uh, Mark, are you with us? I'm just testing now. Can you hear me again? Yes, we can hear, but we can not see you. Okay. Yeah. What I, what I did was I turned off my uh, camera immediately just to try to uh, you know focus on the voice, and if the voice is back, that's very good. Right. Yeah. So you're back. Yeah. Okay. If you're happy with my voice. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Anna. No worries. Okay, so we were talking about the uh, working capital cycle. And as I said, the uh, key thing here, let me just, uh, there, the key thing here is the timing of cash. And you can see here, it's not only a question of receivables management, it's not only a question of when you pay your supplier, it's also a question of how fast you process the materials. Because the quicker you process the materials when you receive them, instead of letting them decorate your uh, warehouse for weeks and weeks, the quicker you're gonna be able to complete the sale and therefore complete the uh, collection of the receivable. So everybody is involved in the uh, cash operating cycle and then speeding it up, not just the financial management. And that's one thing which the treasurer should be making very clear to everybody right across the organization. That's why I like to see that uh, the treasury is really at the center of all operations because you really have to, uh, uh, everything that happens in the company, especially on the asset side of the balance sheet is affecting you uh, as, as managers, uh, treasury people, when you're worried about the liability side of the uh, of the company. Of course, we also have uh, to deal with cash flow forecasts. Now, this was a question which came up quite a lot as well last time. Um, 
uh, during the uh, couple of webinars we, we did about how to uh, financially model the future. And that's, of course, not a such a simple thing to do. And uh, we didn't have any ready-made answers there. All we could say was make sure that you do have the tools in place to be able to uh, uh, do scenarios of, your, of what the uh, future months could bring in order to have a clear idea of how that's going to impact your cash position and uh, break even levels and things like that. So you need to have all the tools in place just because the conditions have changed doesn't mean you throw out the tools. We have to work with the tools we have, but maybe we need to design some new tools as well. And this is something we're all looking, for, uh, looking out for. This is why I would say the treasury management is more uh, a matter of mentality than it is uh, just memorizing all the different tools that you have in the uh, toolbox. Okay. Um, this slide here is just a uh, showing the importance of understanding your costs in the business, because if you're doing cash-based uh, forecasts for your business, you are obviously engaging in uh, management accounting, which means that you are uh, you know, I'm not an accountant. I leave that to, to Mike Turner. He does a great job doing uh, IFRS uh, courses and so on. Uh, I'm focusing on the management accounting side of things. As a banker, I'm interested in looking at uh, what happens to businesses and to imagine what, what, what challenges they face and risks they face going forward. Now, when you have or, or, or when you're managing a company on the inside, you have all the you have access to all the data to be able to uh, look at things from the standpoint of uh, fixed and variable costs, and therefore you should have an idea of what the contribution is in your your company, what the contribution is of your different products. You may even have systems in place which are as sophisticated as uh, activity based costing to be able to understand what the uh, cost of delivery is for different uh, products and services. It's a fascinating field, and in times like these, it's a very important field because it really does allow you to uh, uh, assess which uh, products are still making money and which products might you wish to discontinue. Those are the kinds of exercises which a company should always be doing anyway, even when times are good, they want to maximize their bottom line, and therefore they should always be uh, looking to make their uh, operations more efficient and their financial management as good as possible. The company that waits for a crisis before it wakes up and starts measuring these things, it's, it's probably too late. And that's why it's extremely important uh, for you to be uh, 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 continually upgrading uh, your skills in, uh, in these areas. Okay, then of course, there's the issue of uh, budgets. That's also an area that we cover and uh, do in, in various courses on financial management. Uh, and the, the idea that uh, budgets may well be, uh, have seen their, their uh, day. In other words, budgets are considered to be somewhat um, old fashioned. And there's no better excuse or, or example of that than now. If you think of uh, lockdown starting in, in March, which is not even the first quarter has ended yet. And, uh, and uh, people made budgets for this year. Well, think about how the budget's gonna look like for the rest of the year. You can basically throw the budgets out because you're facing a new situation now. And therefore um, you probably have to revise everything that's been done. I saw some of the uh, airlines came out with their first quarter results and uh, they were reasonable, but of course they would be because uh, they went into the new year with a uh, momentum in their earnings and uh, revenues. And so January was normal, seasonal adjusted, of course, uh, February was normal and three weeks of March was normal. Only the last week of March, I'm thinking of uh, UK specifically, the last week of March was when things kind of, uh, as we say in English, they cratered. In other words, they, they plunged, they, they, they fell off a cliff, which means that the second quarter numbers are going to look pretty uh, drastic. So let me ask you this, just in the context of uh, general financial management, does it make any sense to even bother doing any kind of variance analysis with last year's budget? Uh, for second quarter numbers that will come up at the end of uh, uh, June? 
I think the answer is plainly no. We know that there are going to be adverse variances pretty much everywhere, and uh, there's there's no point in even uh, analyzing that. It's just number crunching, which is really kind of a waste of time. Okay, so these are just things that I'm trying to uh, uh, sort of uh, prepare us to to find if we haven't already reached that stage of uh, having the adaptability and mentality of mind to be able to uh, deal with uh, challenges to, to understand that we don't know everything. And yet to have to make some assumptions and decisions along the way, knowing that we don't have all the information we would need. Um, the military uh, uh, analogy is probably the most uh, uh, compelling one in my, my uh, opinion as far as planning, business planning is concerned, because uh, it's very much true. For example, you train your military, you train soldiers how to uh, uh, load and unload their guns, and they go through uh, various types of exercises and so on, maneuvers, scenarios, and so on. But what's interesting is that when the shooting really starts, then, then of course, all the plans seem to be non-existent or everything goes against plan. And uh, the key thing is you still have to make the plans. Planning is indispensable. The plans are the ones that become useless. Just recently, we had uh, D-Day celebrations, for example, uh, the end of the war in Europe. And uh, you know, you look at these old documentaries of these guys hitting the beaches and so on. Well, they, they're, they're plans. They, they, they planned to, to send tanks onto the shores. And in many cases, because the water was so choppy, the, uh, the tanks sank and only a few of them reached the shore, which means that the soldiers that reached the shore, the, the beach, they were very much uh, uh, exposed to uh, enemy fire. So what, what Eisenhower here is saying, that's Eisenhower, uh, is that um, the plans, the specific plans you, you make, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't actually match reality when the, when the time comes, when push comes to shove. But planning is indispensable in the sense that you've trained and you've prepared so that you know how to uh, deal with uh, things that change as they happen in sort of in reality. And I think that's the spirit we need to uh, summon uh, up now in order to uh, deal with the, uh, with the pandemic. Okay, uh, here's some more concrete ways in which uh, you might be thinking about your treasury structures, for example. Um, the treasury activities and the way in which you structure treasury and its uh, operations may very well be influenced by um, what's happening now uh, to businesses uh, during and after the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. For example, with regard to cash concentration system. Now, every system, this is sort of cash pooling, where uh, banks can help uh, companies to collect their cash more efficiently to get it pooled and invested in, uh, in, in a uh, centralized way. This may be a time and an environment in which you are, uh, you might want to rethink your uh, cash management procedures. Uh, certainly, supply chains are going to be um, reconsidered and restructured. Supply chains may be uh, shortened. They may be actually focused more in country. Okay, so uh, as we lost Mark, I'm here. And uh, as I'm not that expert in this treasury um, uh, topic, I can insert you with a bad joke. Uh, so <laughs> basically, why, uh, what do you get uh, uh, with a fish without eyes? Fish. So yeah, that's my bad joke. Um, while we wait on, on Mark. Mark, can you hear us? Uh, I believe no. Okay, so uh, we'll just wait for, yeah, Mark? Mark, can you hear us? So yeah, I believe that everybody's internet connection is uh, overcrowded now that we are all working from home. 
and we are all experiencing uh, this kind of technical mark. Yes. Yeah, we lost you again uh, for 10, 15 seconds. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry for this. Can you hear me again? Yeah, we hear you and we see you. You're good to go. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, I notice I do, I do get a, uh, a yellow pop-up screen on, on GoToTraining, which tells me if my uh, audio connection was was lost. So that's a that's a good thing. Okay, so uh, I was talking about the the need the need for a treasury uh, structure, how you organize yourselves in, in treasury, has to follow closely and has to adapt itself to changes in the uh, general business structure on the operations side. And since for sure uh, the COVID is going to uh, cause changes to take place in the structuring of supply chain, for example, uh, there's without a doubt Treasury is going to have to rethink how it uh, organizes its activities as well. We don't know how it's going to look yet. Those things are under discussion, but the uh, CFO has to be a party to that and the Treasurer to understand what uh, adjustments they have to make in, in their uh, business. Now, the, uh, another example would be uh, if you don't have already netting systems in place, uh, the multilateral netting, and this is uh, here we're talking about within uh, companies themselves, within business groups, um, to be able to offer them cash management services, which have a, a currency angle to it, so that the uh, companies can uh, minimize the amount of uh, foreign exchange buying and selling that they have to take that they have to do in order, in, in other words, to be able to uh, coordinate and uh, eliminate extraneous or uh, superfluous transactions. Now, um, I've been not only teaching this concept for years, but I actually uh, uh, sold these kinds of systems to corporate uh, customers in uh, Switzerland uh, with, with success. And um, you might say, why should a banker want to help a company to minimize the amount of foreign exchange that they do? Well, clearly, uh, uh, my, my first uh, netting sale was to a major Swiss uh, electronics um, group, and uh, they didn't do any business with us. And to get a foot in the door, I thought the way I could appeal to them was to uh, appeal to their idea of saving uh, unnecessary costs by, uh, by uh, introducing a multilateral netting system. And the idea was that if they did that netting system with us, they would ask us to bid on the foreign exchange that would be left over, the net amount of the foreign exchange. So that was a good win-win type of situation. Okay, now I'm getting into a sort of treasury selling uh, sort of uh, mode here, and that's not my purpose today. But I'm, I'm trying to uh, suggest that innovation, uh, whether it's pushed by banks or whether it's pushed by the customers of banks, by corporations, it, it, it comes because of changing circumstances and because somebody has been thinking about how can we do things better. That's the mentality I'm talking about. Uh, the last step today, I will talk about financial engineering and uh, use a couple of examples there to be able to uh, uh, give you practical ways in which uh, financial engineering actually brings real uh, dividends to, to, to companies. And the whole point of the uh, examples is to get people to think about, uh, to think in a uh, creative way, because that's how we're going to uh, uh, su succeed in a business, is to uh, think creatively and to develop new solutions. Not all, you can see we have new problems now, and sometimes the old solutions aren't going to fit the new, the new problems. So multilateral net lateral netting is just another way in which um, uh, you know, one can improve one's uh, cash management uh, systems and structures. Okay, time is uh, pressing us. I'm going to move ahead now to the next stage of our discussion today, because on our agenda, you can see here we're halfway through assessing corporate financial health. I wanted to uh, just spend a few uh, minutes to address the issue of financial analysis. Now, you know that you can buy a book about financial analysis, balance sheet analysis, and so on. You can buy a book about financial ratios. That's wonderful. That's good. Well, we assume that you've read those books. You've uh, uh, memorized the financial ratios. What we like to do is we like to take forward that uh, basic knowledge and to uh, process it in the form of seminars, case studies, and to get people to think 
what's behind those numbers and to think uh, uh, imaginatively and specifically uh, what those numbers mean. And that's how we tackle the story of uh, financial ratios. So if I just throw a few ratios up here, for example, everybody knows about this. Even taxi drivers know what the current ratio is and how it is um, uh, defined. And uh, I picked a few solvency uh, liquidity ratios here just to uh, uh, remind everybody that yes, we have to know what's in the traditional toolbox. And yes, we should um, measure these things and our, our, our systems should be able to automatically take our financial statements or the statements of a customer, for example, and generate all these ratios. But your job begins, once these ratios are generated, to go through them and to see whether they're important or not, whether they need comment or further examination. In other words, as my colleague Mike Turner likes to say, the uh, financial ratios are not answers in themselves. They, they, they are actually uh, putting questions. They're, they're, they're uh, flagging questions that the uh, analyst uh, needs to ask. And, and this is, uh, in this way, we like to uh, uh, emphasize the importance of uh, improving uh, and refining one's analytic skills with regard to uh, financial uh, analysis. So if we just see here working capital ratios, we talked about you know, managing uh, receivables for ma the purpose of management reports. Um, you, know, you need to convert these things into uh, understandable uh, uh, standard ways of saying how fast are we collecting receivables and how many days on, on average and so on to track the trends to report this to senior management. Of course, you spend part of your time explaining to senior management what they're looking at when they open the book and they or the briefing memo and they, and they see these ratios. You have to highlight for them what the importance are of them. Okay, well, today my purpose is not to go through the many, many ratios that exist. Uh, what I'd like to do is actually talk about um, a particular, a couple of ratios working uh, in combination with each other, which uh, uh, is called the DuPont ratio. Um, this this here, what you see here, are uh, 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 long-term ratios relating to leverage of company debt to equity and things like that. Uh, it's a big universe of, of ratios. But what I'm particularly interested in, uh, and just one thing here I should mention as well, that this is a this has got to do with capital market. Okay, so not not strictly treasury in a short-term sense. The uh, level of gearing which is appropriate to a company. Uh, again, our approach, and this is what I, I put this up here to uh, emphasize, that our approach is to understand um, uh, these measurements uh, of gearing, debt to equity, and so on, in the context of industry, in the context of the uh, specific company where it is in its life cycle. And that's why we need to uh, understand in context what we're doing and what these what these things mean okay i think i i hope i got that idea across that's really where we uh, spend uh, developing the value added in the uh, training programs that we we offer okay so let's just go here to uh, uh, a, a short story in case now this is um uh hewlett packard and texas instruments they're in the same uh, industry and i just wanted to look at a couple of uh ratios here that are uh, um, that are offered. Now, you'll notice that um, in this particular case, uh, we, we have here a return on equity um, measure that we made for the two companies. And the two companies actually have a uh, return on equity, which is quite similar to each other. Probably, uh, they're, they're probably separated only by a rounding difference. And uh, if I was in a more interactive uh, mode, uh, I would ask you, but I can ask you right now, and perhaps through Anna, you would be able to record uh, your answers through the uh, the chat box. I think that's probably a, the, the most efficient way. In this way, I can continue to speak, and you can look at these numbers here, and you can tell me which company do you think is uh, performing uh, better, has the better performance. Which company, if you are a banker, for example, would you feel more comfortable lending to possibly, or uh, if you were buying the shares? Of course, when we do financial analysis, we do it from a number of different points of view. What is the purpose of the financial analysis? But just a priority now, if you just are given these, uh, these two companies with a couple of uh, uh, ratios, you can see here there's a return on sales uh, ratio, which has been 
uh, generated for the two. There's an acid turnover ratio. You can see that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the sales to the assets of the company, sales to assets. That's how we define the asset turnover. And then, of course, the leverage here, the leverage being the financial leverage. That is the amount of uh, the assets to the equity in the business. And the higher that number is, it's an indirect way of measuring the debt to equity ratio. The higher the assets in relation to your equity, it means that you have relatively more debt, which is uh, uh, funding those assets. So the leverage here, this is uh, working in the same direction as uh, your typical uh, debt equity ratio. The higher the uh, leverage, the, the, the more debt you have in relation to equity uh, in the business. Okay. Uh, Mark, um, sorry to, to interrupt, just to mention that everybody can use uh, the chat box uh, because, yeah. yeah, not to get mixed with the questions. So basically, they can uh, use the chat box answering to, to, to your uh, questions and we'll okay. be able to follow them through the chat box. Perfect. Thank you very much. I, uh, I, I haven't actually worked out what the most efficient way is to, you know, we would like to be able to. Um, stop and uh, have discussions along the way for uh, these kinds of points and we will be we do that in our programs we are developing the uh, uh, online uh, 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 teaching methods for being able to include uh, the audience into the discussion uh, but in the webinar i've got to do that in a slightly more uh, primitive way in a more basic way so here uh, I'm nevertheless asking, uh, feel free uh, to make use of the chat box if you have looked at these few, these three ratios that I put up here and to ask yourself, um, which company would you consider to be the uh, better performing company? Okay. So don't be shy. You can uh, jump in any time you like. Now, let me comment on those uh, co on those uh, ratios. But very, very, um, I'll do it in a very brief, in a very uh, synthesized way. Okay, um, last time when uh, we did a webinar, last webinar we did, I did with Mike Turner. He put this question to his audience, who was a bank audience. And we had six votes in favor of Texas Instruments and we had two votes in favor of Hewlett Packard. And I, I think part of the reason was that the uh, higher return on equity was seen as being good for uh, investors and therefore they should be happy with this. Uh, I being a banker uh, in background, I would look at the leverage and I would say, well, the leverage of Texas Instruments is higher than the leverage of Hew Hewlett Packard's. Therefore, I have a question about whether uh, Texas Instruments is using too much debt. Do they have a sufficient debt capacity? And do I, as a banker, feel comfortable lending them money compared to Hewlett Packard? So you can see here how we interpret these ratios depends on what it is that we want to achieve. Let's look at another example here. If we look at the return on sales, you could say, well, the uh, Hewlett Packard looks like they are. Um, generating a 16% return on sales. That's uh, net income, net profit, uh, in relation to the sales of the company. This is the net profit margin that's being measured here. And uh, Hewlett Packard has a much better return on sales, 16% compared to Texas Instruments, 10%. So you'd say, okay, there, it looks like Hewlett Packard is the winner. Then we go to the asset turnover and we say to ourselves, okay, now, for every uh, dollar of uh, sales, um, or for every dollar of assets, how many sale, How much sales are we generating in the companies? And here we have a better result from Texas Instruments. In other words, Texas Instruments is, is generating more dollars per dollar in sales per dollar of uh, assets that they have. That sounds very efficient. That sounds really optimal. It sounds like they're doing a better job maybe higher utilization of capacity than Hewlett Packard. 
But is that true? Is that true? Can we argue that, can we come to these conclusions only through the numbers? And my, my answer to that would be probably not. Why? Because the perception, if you know the industry and you know about these two companies and the, uh, the, they're pretty well established companies, obviously, you could see the perception of people who know the industry is that, that uh, Texas Instruments is considered to be something of a dinosaur company. Old products, they're not very exciting. Uh, they're not really keeping up with uh, what's, what's happening. Uh, they, they, they haven't always made the right choices in terms of how to position themselves strategically. Hewlett Packard is a much more dynamic co company, which has been doing a lot more uh, uh, innovative things for, for the market. Let me just leave it at that, okay? You can find industry analysis for these uh, businesses and you can get descriptions to be able to uh, uh, buttress or to reinforce what I said. Now, let's go back to the numbers and try to put them in context. So Hewlett Packard has a higher return on sales because they have uh, more attractive products people want to have, whereas Texas Instruments has older products which are not, uh, the, the profit margins on those are eroding. Maybe they're giving discounts to sell those uh, older uh, products. So that can explain the, uh, or that's consistent with the perception of Texas Instruments as being kind of an old fashioned company. What about asset turnover? Well, the problem here is that being an older company, Texas Instruments has not kept up with investments very much. And therefore, their, uh, their asset uh, 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 endowment in the balance sheet is going to decline. In other words, it's going to get written off. It's going to, the denominator is sort of shrinking. So you could see here that the asset turnover is, is a combination of sales in relation to your assets. And of course, you want to have your sales going up in relation to your assets, but you don't want your assets to be shrinking because you're not reinvesting in the latest technology. I can play the system and I can push up artificially the asset turnover number by keeping my ass, my sales flat and by not reinvesting and therefore I have a declining asset number. I'm talking about the uh, net book value of my assets. So here it's a clear case where the asset turnover of Texas Instruments is not indicative of a good situation. In fact, what it's doing, it's covering up a bad situation. And that as an analyst, you need to be aware of that to be able to look at a company, to be able to understand it in context and qualitatively be able to assess the uh, kinds of financial ratios that we work with typically. This is adding a story or meaning to the numbers. And this is why it's important for a good analysis uh, analyst to be able to do this. I'm thinking an analogy to the asset turnover story. How, how interesting it is that uh, now people talk about the uh, fatality rate or the lethality of COVID, for example. And they say in some countries, so you have so many deaths, but such a low rate of infection. Well, that's because they're not testing. So the denominator is vastly understated and therefore the uh, lethality rate is going to look much higher than if you were to test and have uh, a better, uh, a more accurate number of what goes in the denominator. I think from uh, anything you've read about the uh, pandemic, that, that idea just playing with the numbers becomes very, very clear. And we know that in, uh, in uh, business, when you're generating uh, financial ratios, you can game the system, you know, to make budget, people sort of play with the numbers, they try to uh, uh, manipulate the numbers and so on. We, we want to get beyond that. We want to see what's really going on in the business. Now, this is the last part coming back as a banker to the leverage ratio here. This is really interesting. So Texas Instruments, in order to uh, uh, make up for deficiency that they have on the uh, return on sales, they uh, have a higher asset turnover, but they also have to leverage up the company in a financial sense to be able to achieve a return on equity. In other words, they're taking a higher level of financial risk by uh, funding their assets with a higher percentage of debt in order to get the same ROE as Hewlett Packard. So even as an investor, you would have to ask yourself, how much risk are you incurring uh, in order to achieve the same uh, return on equity if you were to buy the shares of one or the other company? And that's something which we talk about, the relationship between risk and return in uh, the corporate finance parts of our programs. Uh, that's capital market, that's business valuation. Those are all extremely important areas 
that as a treasurer, you need to know. The CTP also goes into the uh, capital market and the long-term aspects of funding businesses and so on. So these are all parts of the uh, treasurer's toolkit that we have to be aware of. So make sure you are up to speed on that stuff. And as I mentioned before, of course, the uh, uh, new circumstances and new conditions in the markets will force us to rethink how Treasury uh, has to find new solutions to the uh, challenges that face us. Okay, so that's what the DuPont formula is. It's putting those three uh, 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 ratios together to generate net profit to uh, equity. That's what the return on equity is. But you can see by dividing it up uh, like an accordion into these three um, separate uh, indicators, we can actually drill down and analyze inside the business to see where the problems are, to see where we're uh, doing well or we're not doing well. You can see that all parts of the business are uh, involved in influencing what's happening here in the, uh, uh, the, the what, what steers these uh, ratios. So the Stupon system ratios, this is like a really good way to uh, look at the uh, performance of a company because you're really trying to uh, uh, get behind the numbers to understand uh, what's happening here on the, uh, the uh, leverage. This is the last ratio we talked about. That's the uh, investment stream. That has nothing to do with what's happening on the operations side. The operations side of balance sheet, the assets, is the income stream. And the income stream is talking about the combination of uh, operating profit margins and the asset turnover ratio. The two together is what gives you your return on assets. But by breaking it down into the uh, most granular uh, ratios here, we can actually extract and uh, uh, come to some conclusions about what the implications are for our business, what we're doing well, what we're not doing so well, and what we can improve on. And you can see here, with regard to Texas Instruments, it's very much a story of um, a business model and strategy. I mean, the company needs to uh, rethink itself entirely, otherwise it might just eventually uh, uh, die. Okay, uh, leverage, you can see here, uh, there's a discussion under each of these ratios, which I'm not going to go into today because I wanted to simply bring to your attention how important it is to be able to uh, 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 use the uh, financial ratio as a starting point, working back into the operations of the company to be able to understand what's going on in reality and to benchmark. You want to benchmark this stuff against other um, uh, businesses in your industry, as we did here. We put together two companies in the same industry to try to understand um, in what way they are similar, in, in what way they are uh, uh, different from, from each other, and to understand the differences. And when you do an analysis of your own business, you also want to uh, understand what you're doing well, what you can do better, and how to uh, raise, uh, how to identify and remove uh, weaknesses in your business. Again, you can see here in our uh, some of our programs, we, we spend sufficient time breaking down these individual um, uh, uh, financial indicators, ratios, and, and doing the detective work necessary to say what's happening with regard to uh, uh, costs, for example. Are we managing costs? In the webinar we had on the uh, COVID, we talked about discretionary, non-discretionary costs. Earlier today, I talked about the fixed and uh, uh, variable costs, knowing what your contribution is in your in your business, um, what's avoidable, what isn't avoidable as costs in order to make your operations uh, more efficient, but without increasing the uh, risk that you take. Think about it. Strategically, some people went to single source uh, supplying because it was probably the cheapest, going uh, only for a, a Chinese supplier, maybe several Chinese suppliers figuring, okay, if uh, one supplier fails, I have the other supplier I can switch to. And then suddenly finding that the whole of China has been shut down at some point, and therefore it becomes problematic for them to uh, uh, to source. So diversification costs probably has costs attached to it. But going forward, we have to take those things into account, and we have to ask ourselves: Do we uh, necessarily accept the higher uh, costs of uh, diversification in order to reduce the risk to our uh, businesses? Those are the kind of discussions we need to have. And uh, turnings, of course, I, I will just leave this uh, uh, unproductive machinery, um, uh, whether the uh, 
buildings, you have assets which are not being used, can or are they overvalued? Should they be removed? Should you sell some things on your balance sheet and uh, uh, turn them into cash, reinvest them in more profitable uses? Uh, there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of questions here that we could put under each of the uh, different uh, uh, ratios. Okay, I don't want to beat this uh, beat this issue too too much now. I, it was just to uh, get the point across that we have to be uh, uh, insightful when we do financial analysis and find the red flags. You can see here a number of issues relating to uh, quality, health, uh, labor, motivation, uh, timeliness. These are things which are non-financial, but they have financial impact. A lot of these are qualitative. We have to measure them. Sometimes qualitative measures are early warning indicators. We don't want to wait until we've closed the quarter to see how we did financially. We need to monitor as we operate to understand where the uh, problems are that are going to hit us in our results down the road. Okay. That's what I wanted to do with DuPont and financial analysis today. Let's come back to uh, agenda now. Um, a few more minutes here, just on uh, foreign exchange and uh, interest rates, uh, just to highlight the importance of uh, the idea of financial engineering. And the idea is this, we have many different types of ways of uh, hedging uh, interest rate and currency risk. We cover this in the CTP, we do it in the CBTM, for example. We, we touch on it in the financial uh, management uh, programs, the other programs we do. Um, I would need five days of your time to be able to go through uh, each of these instruments in great detail with examples and case studies. We would do that in our programs, we can't do that today, but as treasury uh, people, you need to know these things. Okay, now let's just look at a, uh, one one case here just to uh appreciate what's going on with regard to uh i'm, I'm going to take out of the blue one mini case i just like to discuss it with you i'd like to say okay talk about currency futures contracts currency futures contracts those are things which are traded on an exchange um, you can buy and sell uh, currency futures that are denominated in major currencies they have particular settlement dates they have uh, particular uh, uh, sizes, in other words, what the uh, uh, amount or, or volume of a currency that you can buy or sell, it's all determined by the exchange, okay? Not going to go into those details now. I want to look at a hedging story. I want to say, okay, let's say we have a U.S. company, U.S. dollar company, which is, of course, dollar-based. Excuse me, let me just uh, activate my pen here. So U.S. company, I'll do it in red. I hope that's visible to everybody. Uh, they have a one million pound loan. This is pound sterling loan maturing in uh, one month. So they're gonna have to repay uh, one million pounds in one month. And what they do is they want to hedge their foreign exchange risk in this story here. And they wanna use the futures market, okay? So they have the intention of hedging currency risk and they want to uh, use the futures market. And let's just say for the sake of argument, that the pound uh, dollar uh, spot rate is 125. That's $1.25 to one pound sterling. And now here's a transaction which is done. Transaction is they went into the futures contract, they went to the uh, uh, futures exchange, and they contracted to sell 1 million pounds verse, uh, in the form of a futures contract against the dollar. At a contract rate, the futures contract they sold out is at 125. That means that the uh, contract is denominated in pounds, but its uh, its price is determined in uh, U.S. dollars. The price per pound is one dollar twenty-five. That's how the uh, this is all pricing convention. And before you make a transaction, this is all you need to know about the uh, exchange. You have to deposit margin there. Uh, and you have to know when the settlement dates are and so on. Now, here's my question to you, just a priority on the basis of this. And this is oftentimes how uh, currency uh, uh, currency hedging is uh, is taught. Question would be, is this a hedge? And you might look at it and you might say, well, if you're a senior manager, you might say, well, yeah, I guess it looks like a hedge. I rely on the treasury people to get it right. If I'm the general manager of the company, I said we wanted to hedge the uh, pound sterling uh, risk and uh, somebody said, okay, we, this is the transaction we did. 
I will take it on good faith that it represents a hedge to the company. Now, my question to you is, is it a hedge or not? Again, you can use the chat box to answer yes or no, or maybe with a question mark if you're not quite sure. Um, and then I'd like to answer that question. This will just take me a couple of minutes, but the point I'll be making here will be one of uh, how we have to use common sense to, well, we have to know technical knowledge plus common sense to be able to, uh, to uh, solve these problems. Okay, so here, uh, let's just see if we have a chat box, if anybody's making use of it. Uh, yes or no questions, yes or no answers. Okay, I believe that uh, so, some of them are using uh, the question uh, box. It's not a problem. So oh. we have, yes, we have two, yes, it's a hedge. We have one yeah. uh, forward rate, one month, no, not a hedge since they use spot. Another yes. Yeah. Um, so. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. That's already a good survey, uh, just the responses we got now. I, I appreciate that. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to just go and uh, talk through this uh, this issue now. So first of all, I'd like to just say, um, yes, the uh, spot rate, I used it for the sake of mathematical simplicity. I uh, made the futures contract rate at 125. I know it's equal to each other. That's probably unusual that that would be the case. However, I'm just assuming that interest rates and, and pounds and, and dollars in this case are the same. Uh, and, and I'm just assuming that the interest rates are close to zero. And therefore, there's a very little difference between the uh, spot and the one month forward. OK, I could have used a different number here, higher or lower than the spot rate. So the, uh, uh, the uh, attendee who answered uh, and noticed that, I give you full marks for, for making that comment. And, and you are conceptually correct, and you are to be uh, congratulated for that, okay? So th let's just accept the simplification for the moment, how I've done it with the 125, because what I'd like to do now is to just make a quick analysis and say, okay, let's assume after one month, the spot rate is moving to 130. So we've had a, uh, a decided uh, movement in the pound uh, dollar uh, rate, okay? In other words, the uh, pound, you will see has gone up because we have to pay more dollars to buy the pound uh, in one month. The spot rate has moved up. So the pound is strengthened, okay? Now, what does this mean for us in a, uh, in a practical manner? Well, in a practical manner, at maturity, two things have to happen. First of all, we have to repay this, uh, this loan, okay? So the first thing is we have to buy the sterling to repay the, the loan. And therefore, the loan repayment, we're going to have to buy sterling at the new spot market at 130. In other words, the sterling has gone up from 125 to 130. It's appreciated during the month. So if the company had this pound loan to repay in one month, the idea of hedging it, if they want to hedge, this means they want to avoid the consequences of the pound going up in price. But look what happened. They have to repay the pounds and they have to buy the pounds spot market at 130. And this is not good for them. Okay, so the pound went up, that's bad, but we hedged, or at least we think we hedged. We still have to answer this question here. Some people said yes, some people said no. So let's do the analysis of our Futures contract. This futures contract, we sold the futures contract at 125. I'll summarize that here. We sold at 125. Now, after one month, this uh, futures contract that we had sold a month ago, we have to close out this uh, contract, right? We have to settle it. So we reached the settlement dates, the close out of the contract. I'm using terminology, which is typical of uh, futures uh, contracts. We close it out. We have to buy back the contract because we sold it. That means we were short. Now we have to buy it back to square our position. And we buy back at 130, which is the new price. So if you uh, buy something at 130 and you sell it for 125, uh oh, that doesn't look too good. To me, that looks like we made a loss here on the futures contract. 
Now, my question is to you, how is it possible that this transaction, which was supposed to be a hedge, leads to a loss when the pound went up and we knew we would have to buy more, ex more expensive pounds? In other words, since you have an unhappy face here and an unhappy face here, this uh, transaction that we did one month ago did not operate as a hedge. It was not a hedge because it did not protect us against an increasing pound. What should have happened was that if the pound went up to 130, we should have had a gain on our futures contract to offset the more expensive pound. We should have had a gain of around 0 0.05 plus to cheapen the more expensive pound that we would have had to buy to repay the loan. In other words, our net cost should have been round about 125, which is the level at which we wanted to hedge our position. So now, what's the uh, moral of the story? Just because somebody went out and sold the futures contract doesn't mean that it were acted as a hedge. What should they have done? Well, if I ask you to uh, answer in the uh, question and answer or in the chat box, then of course, uh, you probably will say, hmm, if I go to the futures contract, a uh, futures uh, exchange, if I if selling is not the right answer, then maybe buying is the right answer. And in fact, you would be right. You would buy sterling denominated contracts in order to hedge a uh, sterling loan that you have to repay. Now, for those of you who do this all the time, this is obvious to you. You do it automatically. But for people who are not uh, uh, used to this, doing doing this on an, on a an, uh, daily basis. Uh, what I'd like to do is not to teach this from the standpoint of memorization and say, if you're short pounds, you have to sell, uh, sorry, you have to buy uh, pound denominated futures contracts and so on. I have a whole sheet of uh, summary form that, that does that as like a, a summary sheet. But what I like people to do is to think about it and to think logically and to ask themselves, okay, what's my underlying situation? I have to pay repay pounds in one month. I borrowed them, I'm short pounds, I don't have them. So I'll have to buy pounds in uh, in one month, but I can't uh, buy them ahead of time. Well, I could buy them in a forward contract, that would be a legitimate hedging. But in this case, my hedge was to uh, use the futures contracts. So instead of buying in a forward market, you would buy futures contracts, okay? Now this is a relatively simple question, uh, uh, question but I do this for options. I do this for all sorts of uh, uh, products. I do this for interest rate futures contracts, for example, which are not so obviously intuitively obvious. And I like to take the story from step number one. What is our underlying risk? Tell me in simple words what it is that you are, what risks you are facing. Number two, if you want to hedge it, tell me what your hedging strategy is. Do you buy or sell? the particular instrument. And only when you've got those uh, clarified can you enter into a, uh, can you execute a hedge transaction, which makes sense where there are not gonna be any uh, surprises afterwards. In other words, your unhappy face here in the underlying situation, if you have a real hedge, should result in a happy face in your hedge transaction when you close your, your hedge. Okay, that's the approach we take. In other words, it's thinking what we are doing in, a, in order to be able to understand how we uh, hedge properly. Okay, that's part of financial engineering. It's sort of simple financial engineering. Now, let me just take the story forward. I'd like to just go to financial engineering and talk about one more case, and then we'll open up uh, to any questions you have. And this has uh, got to do with uh, two companies uh, which require financing. Same currency, same maturity. Oops, sorry about that. Let me just go back here. I have to activate my pen again in order to uh, yeah, highlight the key ide ideas here. We have two companies. They want to borrow same currency, same maturity. I'm taking two equal and opposite needs, uh, two, two identical needs from the two companies in terms of how much, for how long and which currency they want to borrow. Now, here's the difference between them. X is looking for floating rate finance and Y is looking for fixed rate finance. And you can see here that if you look at company X, 
X, if they're looking for floating rate finance, they pay LIBOR plus 10 basis points for floating rate money. If they borrow on a fixed rate, they pay fixed 5.7%. How about Y? Y is the other company. They also want to borrow the same amount of currency for the same maturity uh, uh, and therefore, but they want to borrow on a uh, fixed rate basis. If they borrow on a fixed rate basis, they pay 6%. If they borrow floating rate, however, they pay three month LIBOR plus 20 basis points. Now, first question I'd like to ask people is, which company has a better credit rating? And invariably I get a good answer from everybody. They say, why is a better company? Because whether it's fixed or whether it's floating, they pay a lower cost for their loans. That's clear from here. Even if that's the case, however, I would ask you the question, how could an interest rate swap serve both companies? In other words, how could both companies uh, arrange their borrowings in such a way that they actually come off better by doing an interest rate swap? Now, I'm going to, uh, again, in an interactive case, I put people into groups and I put them to work and they have to come up with a solution. This is putting on your thinking cap and, and thinking outside the box. If anybody wants to use the chat uh, or the uh, question and answer boxes to uh, just uh, put a quick answer in, just a phrase or a, a, a word or something, uh, I'll be happy and Anna will be happy to receive it and to, uh, to uh, communicate it to everybody. You wanna take a couple uh, seconds to think about that? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish on this uh, particular case. It's a mini case, it's really an exercise, but I turn it into a, a proper uh, group exercise in, in the classroom. But I would like to ask Anna at this point, maybe if she could just tell me, uh, have we accumulated any uh, questions so far for the entire webinar today? Uh, yes, Mark, we have uh, some questions we, we had in the beginning, then we had, uh some questions related to uh, the, the two uh, companies. Uh, so the Texas Industries and uh, uh, Oh, good. Yes. Good. So, okay. yeah, uh, but I didn't want to interrupt you before, so. No, no, that's fine. That's okay. I didn't need to know the feedback. I was relying on the uh, last webinar I did with Mike. We had, uh, uh, you know, eight, six to two was for Texas Instruments. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the vote was here, but if we had some answers, that's great. Uh, why don't we do the following, Anna? While I leave this slide up so people can actually think about this here, uh, maybe just tell me the question, what are one or two questions from the first part of the uh, webinar. Yes, yes, we can do that while uh, people are focusing on this. Let me just uh, go through the uh, okay. list with the questions. So one of the questions was uh, when we were discussing the, the two companies. So yeah. uh, basically, uh, should we, wouldn't we, we consider the industry? Yeah. Yeah. That we're was... talking about we're talking about the uh, Texas Instruments and Hewlett Packard. Yes. You mean this one? Yes. Yes, of course. Yes. Oh yes, of course. The starting point would be for for the, the industry. Uh, I can tell you at Citibank, for example, uh, in in uh, uh, lending. When we had credit facilities for uh, uh, for certain kinds of industries, we had to get an industry initial. That was for shipping, it was for commodities, it was for uh, uh, construction. In other words, there were some industries that were specialized industries where we had to get a uh, an expert inside the bank to sign off on the credit facilities because they had to look at the facilities and the uh, that were being uh, proposed for the company. And they have to think about it in an industry context. They had an idea where the industry was going and uh, they had to approve uh, the, the, the appropriateness of the, uh, of the uh, uh, facilities. So that, that's an example precisely uh, agreeing with the uh, comment here that we have to have industry expertise. Obviously, if you're shoe companies and other types of uh, 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 you know, broad manufacturing companies, we didn't have industry experts as such, but we did have to, uh, the, the, the relationship manager had to think about industry benchmarking to understand where uh, 
the customer was in relation to its competitors to understand, to make sure that we were working with and lending to the winners in the industry and, and not with the uh, weaker companies. So you're absolutely right. We have to have that context. Please, Anna. Yeah, so we have another question. Uh, if the recommendation is to lower spending and everyone does it, for example, governments, corporations, banks, and people, isn't this approach dangerous if everyone applies uh, applies it as it prevents money circulation? Absolutely, that's a great macroeconomic uh, question. And this, this is a, uh, a good example why businessmen don't always make uh, the best um, uh, uh, economists or macroeconomists or making a government policy. Because if you take a businessman like the one we have in uh, the White House now, he, um, he he thinks in terms of cutting costs all the time. The, uh, the, the uh, government should try to make up for a deficiency in demand. This is called Keynesian uh, stimulus. And this is exactly what uh, we're seeing now uh, from different countries, including even India yesterday with their package, is to uh, make up for deficiency in demand. So he's right. Not everybody can cut spending. The government has to step in. Individual companies do, but the government to provide uh, uh, a demand in order to keep the economy propped up. They're kind of like the missing factor. They have to lean back against the uh, what the companies are doing. So macroeconomically, you're absolutely right. This is an example of Keynesian stimulus and you can see both now and 10 years ago even republicans who want to balance the budget of the government they all become keynesians when the going gets rough why because they depend on the votes of the people so this is life very good comment you gave though thank you very much for for making that comment very important distinction we have to make thank you anna Okay, we have another question. Regard liquidity ratios, uh, what's the percentage that we know the company in risk? How uh, we can distinguish between two different businesses in liquidity ratios? Okay, to distinguish between two different businesses in the same industry, you can uh, develop what should be a, uh, an expected level of liquidity, what you would expect would be typical. On the idea, that if businesses in the same industry are similar, they should all be working towards some kind of uh, optimal level of, uh, of uh, liquidity. In other words, the uh, industry factors, uh, there may be surprises, there may be seasonality, and therefore the level of liquidity that they uh, uh, should keep should be similar to, to, to companies in, in the same industry. That's just as a starting point. Then, of course, we can explain the differences between uh, different companies. Some companies like to take a more riskier approach to liquidity, or they have uh, guaranteed credit facilities so they, they can make up a deficiency in liquidity, or they can raise uh, capital easily because they have very little debt in their in their capital structure, and therefore they can Mark, we lost you. Okay, while we are waiting on Mark to reconnect, uh, I want to uh, to uh, encourage everybody to, to get your questions as we are reading them now, uh, and it will be answered um, as I'm reading them. Also, uh, one more thing, because we, we've noticed I'm, I'm bad with jokes, <laughs> so uh, to, not to, 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 to tell another bad joke, I wanted to um, inform you that we, Leoron, are supporting um, you and all of our, our clients uh, during this time with live virtual sessions, uh, meaning all of the courses are now um, available on, to, on our e-learning platform. And uh, you can get your certification attending uh, uh, the course online. Uh, uh, most of you here are bankers, are connected to treasury, to liquidity. So basically, uh, we have um, scheduled a session on the certificate uh, in market and liquidity in June. Uh, also, there is the treasury professional, banking treasury, a lot of finance programs, uh, risk related. So uh, feel free. I believe most of you uh, already uh, received an email from my side. 
So feel free to, to write me an email if you're interested to hear more about the courses and I'll be glad to assist you. Uh, Mark, you're back, we're seeing you, but I cannot hear you. Yes, I uh, just noticed now that the pop-up screen had come up. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, perfectly. Oh, okay, good. So I'm not quite sure where uh, I got cut out, but I, I was trying to say that the, uh, the liquidity ratios within the same industry, they are important and, uh, and critical. They, they, are, they have only relevance within the industry. Uh, okay, okay Mike, we have now one question that is um, uh, related to the courses and basically uh, it can be related to what I've been saying while you were out. So uh, how you. does the CTP drifter from CFI, uh, TQF and FRM? Oh, very good question. Uh, C uh, CFA, I believe, is the uh, so, second Yeah, one. so it's Treasury, yeah, yeah CFA, uh, TQF and FRM. Um, TQ, uh, Anna, if you could just uh, keep a, a written record of that question, because we're going to have to go back in writing more specifically, because I'm not uh, familiar in detail with the uh, with all the uh, qualifications that are mentioned. OK, so we would need to uh, uh, just do a little bit of research to, to give a, a proper qualified answer. What I can tell you is the difference between the CTP and the uh, CFA, for example, is the CFA uh, is uh, tends to be more portfolio analysis um, driven. It's a uh, it's a longer, it's a more rigorous course, but it's more specifically uh, directed towards people who are in portfolio management who have to uh, handle uh, client um, investment portfolios. So it's got whole uh, sections which are on compliance and uh, ethics and uh, the duties that the uh, in portfolio manager has towards um, clients with regard to knowing your clients and so on. So the CFA uh, is really very um, uh, rigorous and detailed in the direction of portfolio analysis. The CTP is a uh, is a broader qualification. It's uh, it deals with the more practical aspects of uh, managing uh, treasury um, activities with regard to. Uh, payment systems, disbursements, um, uh, financings, uh, interest rate and, and uh, uh, currency risk hedging. And uh, therefore it, it tackles all those things in kind of a practitioner's sort of way. Some people don't really have the uh, appetite or the patience for the CFA and they come out saying it's been too uh, intensive in the, and they don't want to manage investment portfolios. For them, if they're uh, interested in more general uh, skills uh, knowledge level for treasury activities for a corporation, then I think the CTP is the uh, one to look at. You have to look at the uh, websites and at the uh, uh, subjects, the topics which are uh, uh, treated by these, these qualifications in order to see which one is uh, more appropriate for your, uh, uh, your career um, ambitions, okay? Uh, yes, I want to men uh, mention here that uh, all of those courses, are, those are different certifications, and as you mentioned, uh, they uh, th everyone needs to needs to uh, basically uh, see uh, in which direction their career, what uh, they want to move with their careers, and which one will be uh, the best uh, 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 course for them. Uh, as I mentioned, you have my email. I'll be glad to help you to send you uh, all of the brochures on all of the courses. You can compare them, see what are the, the advantages, uh, see what you'll be getting out of each course, and you can make your parallels and uh, uh, see uh, which course is the, uh, the right course for you, of course. Uh, also, one more uh, important thing that I want to mention here since we opened this topic, so basically, all of you uh, that are uh, participating in, on this webinar will get a $200 discount uh, to attend uh, uh, any course from, from our portfolio. Uh, and you can use this. Uh, it will be valid for a week. So you'll receive an email uh, with all of this information. You don't need to remember it. I just wanted to mention that it's a good opportunity if you are considering in, into moving forward with your career and your personal uh, growth. Um, 
Okay, we can continue, Mark, with the questions, or you you can. Or you Anna, to... If I could, yeah, could I jump in here, Anna? Thank you yeah. very much. I just wanted to uh, complete while we have. I'm keeping an eye on the clock. I know people have uh, uh, dinner uh, obligations. Uh, I'd just like to complete the uh, story we have here on the screen. You can still see the screen, correct? The uh, interest rate swaps. Yes. Yeah, it's good. Okay, so. I just wanted to walk through the possible answer here. Uh, maybe Anna could just check and see if there are any recent uh, uh, comments uh, made with regard to the uh, interest rate swap story here. Uh, yes. So basically, oh, good. yes, I will. Uh, so there is one comment. X borrows uh, at uh, 5.70% uh, fixed and Y borrows yep. floating tree, uh, LIBOR plus 20 BPs. Uh, in an yes. IRS, X receives 5.885% fixed from uh, Y and pays LIBOR plus 10 BPs to Y. Both gain 5 BPs. 5 plus 10 basis points, like this, correct? Yeah. Okay, this is what you said. I would say very good, very, very good. Um, I, I think you've just about... You, you, you've, you've caught the idea here, which is extremely good. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, put up the uh, uh, you, you, standard uh, answer here. I just want to refine the answer a little bit, if you permit. I'm not contradicting you. Uh, you're suggesting here that there's a savings of five basis points for both X and for Y. And I'm just going to give you an answer here, which uh, has a slightly different outcome, and then I'll leave it to you to uh, reconcile the difference. Okay, so it's uh, there, there's different possible answers here, but you're thinking in the right direction because the X, in fact, should borrow on a fixed rate and pay to the market 5.7, even though X wants floating rate finance, they should go ahead and contract for fixed rate debt. Now you might say. This is crazy. This is not what they want. But the answer is wait, be patient, and see what the effect will be. Why borrows on a floating rate basis? Okay. Now, here's the uh, system uh, as I like to show it between the two uh, companies uh, in a way which uh, avoids uh, adding a margin to the uh, LIBOR here, the LIBOR plus 10 basis points. The way I like to uh, look at this situation. And I'm just going to uh, draw it in a way which I hope makes sense to you because it makes sense to me. Please bear with me. I'm going to just take this away and this away. And then reactivate the pen. Now, what I like to do is I like to say to myself in this case, is that if X wants to have a floating rate finance and they go ahead and they contract at market rates, the fixed rate, they at least have to pay somebody a floating rate. And that floating rate is based on LIBOR. So at a minimum, we would expect X to pay to Y the LIBOR rate, whatever it is, 5%, 10%, 8%. It's floating in the future, but whatever the LIBOR is, Periodically, they should pay to Y the LIBOR rate. In return, what X should get from a Y is, and here's my proposed, this is one possible solution. Please keep this in mind. If you jot this down, you can uh, play with the numbers. If Y pays to X 5.7, think about what the uh, impact is. If uh, these are the sum total of the payments now. This would mean that X would pay LIBOR for their net borrowing cost, which is floating rate. So they've achieved their floating rate because they receive 5.7 and they pay 5.7 to the market. That's in and out, it cancels. But they pay LIBOR to Y. So that's the LIBOR rate they pay. Now notice, if they borrowed uh, LIBOR, uh, if they borrowed on a floating rate basis, X alone uh, by themselves, they would pay li three month LIBOR plus 10 basis points. Now they pay just LIBOR. So how much do they save? 
they actually save 10 basis points. Let's look at why. What's in it for why? To enter into a swap, both dance partners have to be happy. Why will pay LIBOR plus 20 basis points to the market, but they also have to pay, they receive LIBOR from X, they receive LIBOR, so I say minus L, they receive the LIBOR which they pay to the market, and they have to pay 5.7 to X. This is the sum total of the ins and outs. Let's simplify this. Why they don't they LIBOR, they pay out and they receive. So there's no LIBOR, it cancels out. They pay 20 basis points, that's 0.2% plus 5.7. They pay a total of 5.7%. No, sorry, 5.9%. 5.7 plus 0.2 is 5.9%. Nine percent. Excuse me. I'm very bad at adding and subtracting numbers. Now, five point nine percent. If Y borrowed on a fixed rate by themselves, they would pay six percent. They pay five point nine. They also save ten basis points. You see, in this story here, through this uh, swap cooperation, they each uh, they, there's a total of twenty basis points to be saved. And I arranged this uh, compensating payment between them so that they shared equally the savings that uh, each saves 10 basis points, cheaper borrowing by going through the swap. So that's, a, that's kind of like a pure situation. But I want to come back to uh, our, our attendee and congratulations for uh, solving this part of the question. And it was just an open question about how the compensation should work. If you achieve five basis points and five basis points to each party, you still need to figure out what happens to the other de the basis points, the 10 basis points, which are also saved, who gets it? And I suspect the attendee, I'm not sure, but we can look at the uh, attendance list later on in order to uh, answer that question, may well have been a banker. Why do I say that? Because a banker knows that typically in the real world, X doesn't know Y. X knows the bank, let's say Citibank, and Y knows Citibank. And Citibank stands in between the flows between the two parties. And as they make the payments to the bank or receive the payments from the bank, the bank keeps 10 basis points and gives to the two parties savings of five basis points. So the transaction still works for everybody, but in a more complicated situation, a more realistic situation, the bank is uh, acting as an intermediary in making the uh, interest rate swaps uh, work because it's unusual for two companies to have the same currency, the same amount, and the same maturity to have a perfect match between them. That's why they go to the bank to be able to solve their uh, need to change from fixed to floating rates or whatever their uh, treasury uh, strategy is calling for. So the bank is helping them to, to achieve this. But when you go to the bank, they're gonna charge you a fee. So you better be clear about what it is that you want to achieve and explain it to the bank and then design a transaction that makes sense to you. So the bank isn't giving you what they think you want and maybe charging you too much for it as well. If you want to get competitive quotations from different banks, that's also gonna continue in the future world uh, even after the pandemic, we need to find the best deals properly structured at the cheapest rates. That will; those are rules which will not go away. Okay, I think uh, I've pretty much. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to say that you are right. Uh, he is a banker, so <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, I I I embrace virtually my fellow bankers. Always good to. Uh, uh, and bankers you want there. to hear something interesting? I am a fellow banker as well. <laughs> uh, oh, wonderful. Yeah. Even, the more the better. Yeah, we're, we're good. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay.
Okay. I'm done here. Thank you very much, but I'm happy. Uh, Anna, your call. Any other interesting questions? Uh, yes, time we, can, remaining? We, can, we can read uh, some uh, uh, of the questions that we uh, have here. And uh, also, of course, our attendees can ask a, a question now, so I can read it later. So, um, yes. Uh, okay, here is one. In UAE, is there any industry benchmarks that we could reference to? Uh, this oh, I, could, I could actually ask the banker that maybe question. if uh, he's in the, uh, uh, in the region. Here is another uh, banking question. Maybe is Bitcoin has a different way, uh, like or like cash? So I'm guessing is yep. Bitcoin different than uh, different or like the cash? Yeah, Bitcoin's a different story altogether, and uh, that's a more difficult thing to uh, to talk about. Uh, can you see the screen still? Uh, Hello? On, only black something, black picture. Yeah. We can put this back on again, I think. I just wanted to put it back on, so... Uh... Yeah, I, I think uh, Bitcoin is uh, controversial. But interestingly, the banks are talking about Bitcoin and they are investigating Bitcoin because they do know that if it has any attraction to the market, they have to be in on the game. Even though I know that Jamie Dimon from, from the US has talked about Bitcoin as being problematic as far as, uh, or, or being too speculative, let, it, let us say. So it's a, it's a payment system that avoids um, uh, regulatory scrutiny. So as long as it's uh, unimportant, the regu the governments will not regulate it. If it becomes important, the governments will regulate it. So I think that's a circular answer to, to your question. Not important now, very speculative. You saw what happened to the prices and so on uh, recently. Not something you necessarily want to uh, put your life savings or your pension account into. But if you want to uh, dabble in it as a hobby, by all means. But from a company point of view, I think it would be too ambitious to uh, uh, to deal with it. Okay, uh, it seems I can't turn Yeah, on. we have, have a another question. Uh, how you determine yeah. if, if Hedge is successful? How do you determine if the Hedge is successful? That's a perfect question. Okay, so the Hedge success, and, and you can you can compare you, you can quantify the hedge success, but the, um, the simple answer is, does the hedge serve its purpose? In other words, if you're trying to hedge yourself to protect yourself against um, interest rates uh, going um, up, let's say you have a bond portfolio. When interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So you, uh, you do an interest rate futures contract to hedge yourself against... Uh, interest rate futures, uh, interest rate movements. Your hedge will be successful if, in fact, interest rates go up, your bond portfolio goes down in value, but the hedge is closed out at a profit, which compensates you for the loss in value on your bonds. So it's a practical story. It's like saying, if I have insurance against uh, markets moving the wrong way, then if they move the wrong way, I get compensated. So I'm not worse off than I was before. That's what we mean. Hedge is like having an insurance uh, policy. In the case of the bonds, if interest rates go down, then bond prices will go up. But if you hedged your uh, interest rates already, and you hedged against higher interest rates, but you did it through a futures contract, the result is going to be that if interest rates move down, which normally would be good for you because your bond prices would go up, the, the value of your bond portfolio would go up if you didn't hedge. But if you hedged, that means you locked in through the futures market to fix the price in advance of, of getting out of your uh, bond investments. And then of course, you would not benefit from a movement of interest rates. When you hedge against interest rates using the uh, uh, forward rate agreements, FRAs, which is an over-the-counter instrument, or using uh, futures uh, contracts, you are effectively neutralizing your position against movements in interest rates. 
which means that if subsequently interest rates move in a favorable direction to you, you don't benefit from it. If they move in an unfavorable direction to you, you benefit insofar as you're compensated for the loss that otherwise would have occurred. You see the difference? I hope I made myself clear. I map out those conclusions in a way at the end of the day, after people have gone through the exercises and used common sense, and the conclusions are, yes, that is a correct conclusion, but they know why and they know how. And, when, and they know to go back to look at the example we just looked at before, and they know how to test in practical common sense way, whether the transaction that's been put on the table has in fact been a hedge or not. Uh, For example, if you look at that same question, sorry, if you look at the same question and you do the same story with a decline in the pound sterling, you could say that the pound sterling going down is good for me when I repay the loan. And I will also make money if I sold the pound sterling in the futures contract, if the pound went down, because that's selling short. So I make money on it. That would be a double profit, but still not a hedge. It just means that you were lucky that the pound went down and not up. Because if it went up and you didn't have the hedge, in fact, you did the wrong transaction, you ended up with a double loss. And people have done that in real life in companies because they, they, they jumped before they thought about it. We train people to think. That's what our job is. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Mark. We have another question. What are the strategies of uh, high QLA optimization? Of a high, high sorry? High, high quality liquid asset op optimization. Oh, okay, that's good. So high quality uh, liquid assets will be the, the uh, what, what is the investment strategy or what? Is, I didn't quite follow the question. Question Repeat, is, please. what are the, uh, just what are the strategies? Uh, Oh, high quality liquid assets optimization. Maybe. Yes, okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, no, no I, I think it, it goes back to what I was saying before that people uh, don't like to hold a lot of cash uh, in their balance sheet for a couple of good reasons. And uh, this is why, in many cases, companies that knew that they didn't have positive net present value projects to engage in, they uh, did share buybacks to get rid of the cash. They had nothing to buy, for example. Um, I think now people will hold higher quality liquid assets. They'll be happy. They'll, they'll accept the fact that they get a little bit of income on those on those assets, but at least they, they build up a reserve in case they need to call on those assets in order to be able to cover, um, uh, uh, say, crisis situations such as we have now. So, so I think the optimization will be, uh, again, optimization is really a relative word. What was optimal yesterday may not be optimal tomorrow. And uh, to, to, because the risk profile has changed and to meet the higher level of perceived risks or uncertainties, people will probably have to hold not more cash, but more high quality liquid assets deliberately because they will have to meet the uh, higher risk that, they're, that, that they perceive in, in the market. And uh, their competitors would be taking a higher risk if they don't hold higher levels of near cash types of investment. It's a policy decision you make and you accept the costs that go along with it. The cost will be, it won't be in the form of cash, but it will be in the form of certain types of instruments that at least give you some, some income on it. And uh, we talk about that in CTP, for example, we go through the universe of uh, short-term uh, investments. They don't all have to be they may be government uh, securities, that's the typical one, but they may be other sorts of uh, instruments that you can uh, in invest in to get a little bit more return, but retain, uh, keep the uh, credit risk low and the liquidity high. And the price risk, of course, to, to a minimum. Okay, I hope I answered that question. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I believe that we've gone through, as we started in the middle of the presentation, we've gone through all of the questions so far. Uh, okay. So, yes, if anyone has a question, now would be the time to ask it. 
because I believe that we are about to finish the webinar, right, Mark? We are at the very end. Yes, 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 I think we are there. Time is just about up. It went quickly. Yes, <laughs> it was uh, for me, it was so interesting, like like it started 10 minutes ago. So <laughs> the time okay. flies. Um, OK. Uh, OK, uh, now we have uh, one question. Uh, when uh, is Mark's course? Uh, so as I mentioned, um, uh, after this, you will uh, receive an email um, from my side. You can reply to that email uh, regarding anything that is of your interest about the, the, uh, the, this course uh, and other courses. I will provide you with, with uh, the list with the courses, with the brochures. So uh, basically, I'm at your disposal to help you find the right course for you. Uh, I'm also available on my WhatsApp number. You can text me on WhatsApp as well. And uh, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll help you the best that I can. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, feel free to, to reach out after this webinar is uh, over. And I'll be glad to ask you all of the questions regarding a Mark's course and uh, uh, the other courses that we have in our portfolio that are related to, to what we've been discussing so far. Uh, if uh, we don't have another question, Mark, uh, you want to say uh, something else? I'd just like to say thank, thank you very much for your attention and it's been a great pleasure and I look forward to uh, collaborating with uh, uh, all of you in, in the future. God willing, we get through this uh, period and the uh, happier days will uh, come again. Good luck. Yes, we can We can only uh, hope and pray uh, that, uh, uh, I don't know about all of you, but for me, it's becoming more and more challenging this working from home and I cannot wait to go back to the office and get our lives back to normal. Uh, I just want to, uh, on behalf of Leoron, Mark, and myself, I want to take, thank you everybody uh, that uh, attended this course. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope uh, it was what, what you've expected. I hope your questions have been answered. And uh, I'm really, really glad uh, uh, that we had this uh, uh, nearly two-hour session. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, I am available on my WhatsApp and email. Feel free to, to reach out at any time. Uh, also, should you uh, have some uh, questions about Mark uh, later on or about the quiz, uh, we'll be, I'll be glad to connect you uh, with him uh, when he has the time and he'll uh, answer uh, any questions regarding his uh, courses. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Uh, so, uh, hope we can uh, meet uh, soon again. Uh, and yes, uh, stay safe, stay at home, take care. And uh, next time we see each other, hope it will be at uh, a little bit of better times. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure uh, having you. Thank you. Yes, uh, good day to all. Bye-bye.